Um, it's always difficult to follow Stuart because he's such a great speaker. And I'm going to be take a boring option and go for the slides. Um, so I'm an associate fellow here at Side Business School, but in my day jobs, what I do is uh, media technology. So I do marketing, business development, primarily within the media technology space. And the reason that I wanted to um, pick up this subject really was very much. Um, the key thing, the, the area that I work in, is everything to do with the internet, broadband, TV, all of that convergent area. The issue that we face more than anything in that space is that everybody expects to get everything for free. Basically, you know, my kids are downloading stuff all the time, they're looking at stuff on their MacBooks, they're getting content from everywhere, and they, they expect to get it all for free. But that's not the sustainable model, because what in the end happens is you get the complete dumbing down of television, as we've seen it over recent years, and you, you don't get that, that positive reinforcement for content and quality. So one of the things I wanted to really try and do was to pick up that theme a little bit. Um, I apologize to some extent for these slides in that they are uh, they're slightly academic, but I want to try and use them to uh, reinforce some of this, the, the things I'm going to say. And I'm particularly um, thankful to Uday Fadka. He's the chief executive of a company called Cartesia. And he's also working within the uh, Technology Strategy Board in the Creative Industries KTN, Knowledge Transfer Network. So he's part of the, the whole investment piece about how the government today is getting involved in funding uh, some of the media technology companies around uh, the country. Um, so you know, everybody has seen this sort of graph, which is a typical graph for tech, especially for technology innovation, where you've got the innovators, the early adopters, majority, and laggards. And a lot of people in the room, especially in the technology space, will have looked at the, uh, the classical crossing the chasm uh, Jeffrey Moore model, which is the third of these bars. But actually, it was really interesting listening to Stuart and seeing how at each stage in the early phases you get over these issues by being creative, by being innovative, by looking at areas and interesting stuff that's happening um, and, and then take those ideas and try to build on those. So this is the, the three chasm model which is an extension of the Jeffrey Moore concept of taking it right from the very very beginning you start by having an idea. You then got, you know, the first hurdle is how do you get that to prototyping. Then once you've got that happening, how do you actually make it happen out there in the field and start to build that a business, start to build some sort of an area that you want to really fun focus on and start to take the business forward. Um, then there's a whole Jeffrey Moore thing about building bowling pins and all of those things, so anybody who's read the Jeffrey Moore books will be aware of that. But the whole idea is that first few phases, how do you move that forward and how do you, in an innovative way, start to build on that? Um, the, it's very much, if you like, trying almost to put some, some academic context on what Stuart was talking about, it's gathering information, building the context, the initial opportunity identification, um, well, I, was at a, I spend two days a week working over in Cambridge at the moment, which is quite an interesting concept. And I started to uh, attend some of the um, meetings that are held by the Centre for Entrepreneurial Learning within Judge Business School, uh, which is an interesting little um, undercover thing that I'm doing to see what they're doing and see if we can steal some of their ideas and make them happen in Oxford. Um, I went to a presentation on Tuesday evening. And one of the guys there was talking about a business he created about, it, it was all about um, tracking of products, tracking of, of, of entity or something through a system. And so it was RFID tracking, so ready for it, you can see ID tracking. It's a small piece of technology. You can uh, put it onto anything. It's basically a microchip that you could embed onto uh, anything from tagging of sheep or cows or, or even to, and then to larger products. And you could have an RFID 
sensor in, on your credit card and so people can track it. The interesting thing is that he started with the idea of tracking cows. And so what he had is this, um, this, this uh, kind of this tagging device. And the whole idea is, if you've got, especially the larger, uh, when you've got the larger farms, is you want to know what's happening with the cows as they're moving around the farm. You want to be able to track which ones have been through milking, which ones, have been, where are they in the pastures. And so the idea originally was that he would use it for that sort of uh, idea, that, that sort of technology. And he went out there and tried to sell it to farmers and completely bombed. No customers at all. And then suddenly, for some reason, he got introduced to somebody at BMW. And the issue with a large car manufacturing plant is, is not that there isn't a good solid process about how you put these pieces together and then you know, put them through the manufacturing process. But it's the fact that you've got uh, new deliveries that are happening all over the place and sometimes it's really difficult to track all the pieces for this. And so, in the end, what's happened is that the real application for this technology is within the, the car manufacturing world. And it kind of complete leap from cows to cars. And it's, it, it's because he was open to ideas, because he was you know, open to thinking about new opportunities, and he didn't have any money to do it. So he had, a, had to take the opportunities. And I completely agree with Stuart. The danger is if you manage to get some large amount of funding for your business start, to start with, you then get single-mindedly pursuing a business plan that could be complete rubbish and you're not flexible enough to be able to move with the opportunities and go for revenue first. So, your whole idea is you identify the opportunity, be flexible, review and confirm the key candidates, select the idea and keep them. But this is completely an iterative process all the time. Um, a little bit more information, I mean, in terms of the information acquisition, context setting, the opportunity, the context setting, build the exploitation framework. The whole thing here on build exploitation framework is the value chain. So the key thing here is how does it, what value chain does it have around it? How does that fit with the general market and the possibilities of that particular uh, opportunity? Um, I, initial opportunity identification, review and confirm the you know, so create some sort of mapping framework, and then select the ideas and product, you know, finalize the promising ideas and take them into some sort of delivery product or service. That's a little bit too complicated, so let's skip that one. The key thing here I wanted to, however, uh, to highlight is the fact that the most important piece of this is how do you take uh, the commercial elements of this. You've got the technology, the technical characteristics, the technology capabilities, you've got lots of possibilities, especially within the technology space. But unless you apply the commercial filter and the marketing piece and see whether it's viable, I mean, Stuart's, I, Stuart's um, example of putting it out there for free the important thing was he had a follow-on process on that. He had some idea about, okay, this is a marketing, um, a marketing exercise that was there to create some follow-on business. Without that follow-on piece, then there would be no commercial viability in the longer term. So you could absolutely do the marketing piece, but if, you, if it's going to continue to try and do it on a free uh, possibility, then there's no viable business behind. Um, challenges in building technology businesses, um, I'm very focused on much more of the technology side, so, um, so you have to excuse me for that. But the key thing here is, when you're looking at technology, it's always, you're always trying to keep ahead of everything that's happening. So it's a continual investment, a continual bettering of the product. You're watching the com competition, watching what's out there, seeing how the technology markets move in. Uh, the constant complexity of IP protection. So the, the whole intellectual protocol piece is really key. 
to making sure that, it, that, you, that you have the way of protecting that piece. Um, so product service packaging, market and customer development, promotion and marketing. So once you've got that product, how or that service, how do you put it out there? How do you make sure people know about it? Whether you do it by uh, some sort of you know, very tactical implementations, whether you're doing it through PR or whether you're doing it through a big marketing campaign. Channels to market, that's another key part of the, the whole commercialization piece. Unless you've got um, the right sort of partnerships and the right uh, pieces within the value chain, to it's a partnership, it isn't just a matter of a, a, you know, a customer um, a customer supplier relationship. It's all about how you build the partnership of the channel and to take it to market most effectively. And then, you know, there's a lot of places, especially within the technology space, where whilst you start with a product, you end up by providing a service. So it's not just, you've got to keep an eye on exactly what you're doing in terms of are you really trying to provide a service or are you just providing a piece of especially the technology product, licensing and walking away, or allowing other people to make money with the service delivery. In public markets, 2% of technology companies have created 100% of the network. On average, two technology 10 banks, so stocks that rise tenfold, go public each year. So it's, it's a tough market. It is not easy. And the main thing I wanted to highlight on this slide was really, <coughs> there's a process to making it happen. It's all about developing your personal vision, what are your goals, what are you trying to do. The most important piece, the number two one there, is to find a viable market segment for your product. And that's going to be iterative. It's going to be something that you keep on trying to find. And you may not find it for the first, you know, within those first five years, it's going to take some time to develop that. The various, develop your marketing strategy, milestone chart, these are all pretty standard things in terms of developing a business plan, marketing your venture, raising capital, starting the business operations. So it's a pretty straightforward, step-by-step -step approach. But the most important piece of all of this is having an idea on the longer term goal of how do you make this into a viable, <coughs> commercially viable business. And I think that was my last slide. Oh yeah, one thing I wanted to. This is an example that I picked up the other day. And I read, I just, it, this just, I like this thing. Um, Facebook is about to go public. So this is going to be late May, shares are going to start trading. There's an expectation that Facebook is going to be valued at something like $100 billion which is a hell of a price. It's kind of back to the old days of the technology space. So Facebook has a huge valuation relative to the size and revenue, and how fast the revenue is actually falling at the moment. It's still big, but it's falling. When shares start trading late May, Facebook's going to have valuation of 100 billion. Meanwhile, Facebook's revenues are actually decelerating. They're, out, they're down to 3.7 billion. Valuation of 15 times the revenue would be about 50 billion. And to give, set that in context, Google and Apple will trade at three times or four times revenues, and LinkedIn was 16 times. Obviously, Reed Hoffman did pretty well out of that. The, this is a huge gap, 50 billion to 100 billion, and who's responsible? This guy, Gokul Rajaram. Whose job is it to close the $50 billion gap? The product director of ads, Facebook's main man for ad strategy. This guy has uh, yeah, a task <laughs> to fill that gap, to basically put back $50 billion between the valuation and what's actually happening in terms of you know, a multiplier on revenue. That's a hell of a responsibility. But it's, it's, it's those sort of examples of something like Facebook where you've got fundamentally an advertising revenue flow that could kill the product in its own sense unless it's done really, really, <clears throat> really carefully and really well. This guy apparently is just, a, he came from Google, he's, 
He's been in this space for a long time. He's revered in the industry for making these things happen. But by God, he's got a big task on his hands to make it stick this time at uh, Facebook. Anyway, that's an example I just want to leave on because that really sparked my interest in the last few days. And I think that was it. That's my email address, and thank you very much. <laughs>